nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. The wonderful lads that do a great job there. And worth reading about that man there. So he bet the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. Frustrate podcast as well. Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation. Hello and welcome to a Monday edition of the Managing Madrid Podcast. I'm your host, Keon Sabani. We are now, uh, before we hit record on this one, have done three podcasts in less than 24 hours. And we have one coming on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday at the very least. And you know what we thought? Why not throw another one in there? <laughs> so uh, we have the the pleasure today of inviting on Leah Ravel, Twitch partner and FIFA esports commentator, and probably most importantly, also a Madridista. Leah, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here with a fellow Madridista. Well, I'm curious to know, this is where I w- I'd like to start. How does someone from, I believe, Ottawa, mm-hmm. yes, a become Madridista? Because as 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 a fellow Canadian who um, is a massive Madridista, I had no one growing up talking to be able to talk to. Like a lot of my friends, even if they like football, mostly Premier League fans. Um, that's mm-hmm. changed now. I feel like that's changed a lot now uh, in the last ten years or so, especially after the Ronaldo Messi era. But you know, back mm-hmm. in the day, I was kind of by myself. So I'm curious to know, how did you become one of these? Like, where does your story start? Yeah, so similar to you. Um, and even now, I would say that kind of almost building a brand in the space, it like, becomes very obvious, like, what, who supports who? And and it's very Premier League centric. So um, my partner, actually, uh, when we met, it he was a Madrid fan. And I wasn't super like I would catch the occasional World Cup um, every four years. I've played football my whole life. So I, you know, know the sport, familiar with the sport, love the sport. Um, But yeah, I was like a a World Cup gal um, up until maybe my early 20s, I would say. Um, I'm a lot older than that now. But um, yeah, when I met him, he was like a diehard. And, you know, when you like first meet someone, you kind of try to just they say you know come along come watch the the final come watch the semifinal um in the champions league and at that time it was you know right in our like most incredible era and me being a yes man was like yeah sure i'll come i'll come for the vibes i'll come for the drinks whatever and so uh, what's the timeline here what year are we talking about this is like 15 okay so this is yeah so this is right after la decima um and so um yeah it was it kind of started there and you know once the more time I spent with him the more time I spent like watching ironically actually the first match I watched with him was a Leverkusen match he's a big Chicha fan so um the very first match I watched with him was Leverkusen but then after that yeah it, it kind of just evolved from there and then you know the more I learned about the club the more I you know, fell in love with the players, with the history. Um, Ironically, my favorite player um, that I fell in love with at that time was Marcelo, when I feel like most people, especially in that era, like coming into Madrid fandom would be a CR7 fan. Um, But yeah, Marcelo was, I just identified with him a lot. I feel like um, I'm actually a left wing. I'm not a left back at all. But um, yeah, I don't know his like charisma and the his passion for the club and his passion for the sport kind of made me fall in love with him as a player, but then the club as a whole. So then I went down this rabbit hole of like, okay, well, you know, I'm in too deep at this point, there's no going back. Um, and so I went like, compilations, YouTube videos, like, watching matches back and and learning as much about the history um in the club as I can um cuz obviously to be to be a true madrid fan you have to know like before and afters you have to know 
history. You have to know everything. And so, yeah, that's kind of where it started 10, almost 10 ish years ago. Um, and I think, you know, every year that goes by everything that we have gone through ups and downs since then, um, kind of just like immense more and more why it's the best club in the world. But, uh, yeah. So, and it was, it was that, I think that, you know, it could have, it could have been any club realistically, but I think the the universe aligns Madrid and myself and, and yeah. So I think that, you know, now looking back, I feel like the, the history, the play style, like the, the passion that the club has, like the, the mentality that no one's bigger than the club. I think that um, just really aligns and, you know, even some of the players that have played for the club are some of the, like, you know, you look at someone like Luka Modric and he's like the most humble, like kindest, best leader that, you know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like you find personalities like that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are personalities like that in other clubs, but I don't know. Madrid's just different. So yeah, that's well, kind of where it started. I also love that it was Marcelo that you resonated with. I always said that like when we had Marcelo, the day he leaves is going to be so sad because he's just such a, I don't know what the word is, but it's, he almost felt like, like if I had to make a ranking of just Real Madrid players, I would just like to vibe with, just to hang out Mm -hmm. with, maybe go out to dinner with, play some FIFA with. He'd be at the top of the list of just a fun character Totally Mm -hmm. just doesn't take life too seriously. And I I feel like maybe that is a bit of the Brazilian in him that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've a lot of these guys, Ronaldo Nazario, Marcelo, Roberto Carlos have spoken about this, that we just kind of don't take life that seriously, to be honest with you. So we just like to find the joy in everything. Um, uh, He's at the top of my list of of players that I just love to, to hang out with. And obviously his son is doing great at the Real Madrid Academy level of really talented striker. Um, yeah. So 15, 16. So that's interesting because you joined after La Decima. So you kind of, a mm-hmm. lot of people who became fans around that time, La Decima mm-hmm. was what sucked them in. Mm-hmm. I imagine yep. last year was by far the greatest year that you've witnessed, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's hard to, it's funny because although I hadn't seen La Decima live, I feel like it's, almost like imperative to Real Madrid's history. You know what I mean? Like that was the beginning of um, our legacy in the Champions League. And that was kind of, well, that was the first Champions League trophy that we had won in what, 12 years. So I think that um, it was like, you know, a really, really important moment. Um, But in terms of watching live, yeah, last year, I think, I actually tweeted about this the other day um, and what was the most like, epic moment that Real Madrid's had in their history and led us in our last year. But yeah, I think for me, what I've seen, I mean, it's funny because as Madrid fans, like we just like blow over the three peat, like it's nothing, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, that's like, that's just who we are. It's just what we do. Um, so that was crazy in itself, but um, there, uh, yeah, there was nothing like last year. And, and I was fortunate enough to go to the final too and, and watch us win in person and so yeah I just think there's so many like I can remember specifically in the city match like where I was what I was doing I thought it was done like I was like oh well okay we made it this far another year we go again next year but then like everything changed within a few minutes so yeah definitely definitely probably the most memorable year just the fact that I would even say like that was the best year you witnessed and to say that while you also have witnessed the three peat is staggering in itself because I think I think essentially what happened in the three peat was maybe we got desensitized to it almost we didn't really realize yeah. how great it was. It's this epic European dynasty that no team in history has achieved back to back since Milan in the eighties to do three yeah. in a row is insane. You have to go back to um, the Di Stefano era. Yeah, but last year there was something like I think it's because we weren't the favorites. You know, 16, mm-hmm. 17, that team was so good. Like, all we mm-hmm. talked about was that, was this is this the best team ever? Where does this rank among the greatest teams of all time? Yeah. You have so many players at their peak, Cristiano, Modric, Carvajal, Marcelo Cruz, etc. 
But then last year was just a different kind of beast. I'm curious to know, because you went to the final. What was that experience like for you? Um, forget about the, the the cool fact that we won the game. Did you also, <laughs> did you also uh, like the horror show of the organization of that? It was. Tell, so, tell me your story of that. Yeah, it was. I mean, first of all, it was amazing. Obviously being there, being able to. And I mean, uh, things are a little different from for you now because you live you live in Madrid, right? Back and forth. Yeah. Back and forth. But living, which I'm sure you know too well, living in North America, living in Canada, I, I don't just, you know, we can't just like pick up and go and get season tickets to the Bernabeu and go to every match. You know what I mean? So going to a match in general is like a big thing for us North Americans. It's a lot different than an MLS game or like in Ottawa we have the Canadian Premier League, which is <laughs> great football. <laughs> Um, I so just came to this lo- um, realization, Leah. Sorry to interject. No, it's fine. Riamdra Castilla played against Atletico Ottawa like yeah, a couple weeks yeah. ago. Did you know this? Yeah. I didn't even realize until after it had happened. I was like, what? Yeah, no, I didn't realize actually until like two or three days ago. But it's crazy because that's like Atletico Ottawa is obviously owned by Atletico Madrid. Right. Um, and I have to be a little bit impartial because it's our local team. But um yeah it's kind of cool like all of these players go and like hang out with the first team in in spain which is cool i mean we're they're pretty good like i I can't lie um it's definitely like we have a little a little stadium in ottawa have you been to ottawa are you familiar yes yes many many family road trips and uh (laughs) we're just rolling up and dad's out with the fanny pack taking pictures of parliament hill while like we're just so tired (laughs) yeah (laughs) Not a lot to do, but um, Lansdowne, like where the stadium is at TD Place, it's where our like CFL t- team plays, the Red Bull Black. Um, so it's it's gotten a lot bigger. I mean, like there's not a lot of sport that people watch in Ottawa. So um, it's nice to see a, a pretty loyal fan base for Atletico Ottawa. But um, uh, yeah, it's 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 neat. It's, it's nice to have like we had the Ottawa Fury before, which was literally like semi pro if that you know it was like a regional level team that still played in tournaments and stuff so to have a league to actually like be able to go and support but anyway long story short I feel like it's still not that experience of like going to the Bernabeu or even going to like a European stadium period um so being there to see your team like in the flesh is an experience in itself um because yeah normally you take a what seven hour flight then you have to it's like a whole thing um but yeah besides the fact that we were there and 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 we won um the experience to be honest I was there with PlayStation um so we were fortunate fortunate enough to be in like our own kind of um area there was a like a tent that that we had and we were there long before the game a lot of us were filming content and stuff prior to um, you know, even war- warm up and all of that, you could see when you arrived that it was a little bit chaotic. Like, obviously, there was lots of traffic going into the stadium. And there were two or three buses from the hotel that we were staying at. And the buses couldn't pull up like directly in front or into the stadium. So they like parked on a side street where we then had to get out and walk. But once we parked, there were even like local kids, like just being rowdy, like trying to get on the bus, trying to like the, a lot of the like coordinators that were on the bus had to really like, you know, be firm, like very stern and try and essentially like, you know, move along. Um, and then they warned us you know like any valuables take them off put them in your bag like put your bag under your jacket or hold it close to you just because like where we're walking through like all of these players are either a gonna try and take your break like the bracelets off of your arm or um you know pickpocket but i feel like within reason i feel like sometimes as a tourist anywhere it's kind of you you run into like things like that but that was kind of the most chaotic minute that we had. We were in the tent, we ate, we filmed our content. Um, we actually, like myself, I was at the gate to get into the stadium, like before warm up. Like I wanted to see everything. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss like 
anything at all. Um, but even then, like we, there was probably a dozen, maybe two dozen of us um, at the gate waiting for it to open. And at that time, like the crowds of people have, hadn't arrived yet. Um, but even the t- like, you know, 15 to 25 of us that there were, they were like funneling us through one like gate they only opened one gate and like the gate there was like you know eight nine gates in this area that we were able to enter and they only opened one so everyone's still trying to kind of like push through this one open gate and some of the local kids too were trying to like get in and make their way through but there was not even like you know when you go to other matches or other anything events they like scan your ticket they you have to walk through like a uh you know, metal thing. detector yeah exactly yeah. nothing they were literally just looking for bracelets like to see mm. if we have bracelets so um that was like the extent of the chaos that we experienced um but it's not surprising like once we were in and sat um we were okay like the only thing we really experienced at that point was the game being delayed several several minutes right. um but it doesn't surprise me that it ended up getting really um like dangerous outside given what we saw um because i can just imagine that on a much larger scale um so yeah it's unfortunate that that was what happened um and yeah i'm just thankful that i was able to get in sooner well good for you for to get in during the warm-ups um i know many many people obviously were were not that lucky and that's why there was a delayed start to the game i do remember Mm -hmm. going like three hours before just because mm-hmm. like why not go early just to exactly. be i'm always yeah. like i always just lean towards being early than too late um in situations like that and that even then uh it it took it took literally the three hours to to just get from like take that walk from the metro to getting inside mm-hmm. because at one point uh and I was with the Liverpool fans, and I think you you get lucky based on what which gate you were entering, right? And as yeah. a journalist who's never been there before, you like you just kind of figure out where you're going, you're just kind of following the crowd. And at one point, I remember because I was going in with the Liverpool fans, there was just an ocean of people with red shirts in front of me, <laughs> and I was kind of starting to feel a little bit claustrophobic. And I said, like, you know what? Maybe I just need to get some air. And I looked behind me. And it's just an endless sea of red shirts as well. I'm like, that. I'm not getting out of here. And like people were like, people were lifting up kids in the air just so that they could breathe a little bit, taking turns. Like yeah. it was insane. Um, all right, let's talk about more positive things. We didn't need to go in that direction. It's <laughs> really. um, crazy though. Yeah, it, it was it was a disaster from an organizational standpoint. In preparation yeah. for this podcast, mm-hmm. I watched your latest Twitch stream. I and did. <laughs> as some, and I'm, I did not... I, I'll be very honest. I did not watch all of it. I think it's almost four hours long. It was uploaded yeah. two days ago. So uh, forgive <laughs> me. I did not go delve into the whole thing. I kind of skimmed it. As someone who knows very little to nothing about two things. One, FIFA Ultimate Team. And two, Twitch. <laughs> I didn't really know what was going on. So <laughs> can you explain a little bit what you do? Obviously, like throughout the throughout the whole stream, people were asking you questions. You were talking about Real Madrid and stuff too. So what is it exactly that you do? So streaming on Twitch is obviously a live platform, um, which is kind of nice because I feel like in a world of recorded content, um, it's nice to have something, you know, like raw. Um, I feel you get more of like a sense of what kind of person you're watching and what kind of person they are at their core. Um, so obviously Twitch being a raw platform, I four hours straight you see the good the bad the ugly everything um and then on stream i play fifa ultimate team um which kind of changes the content that i stream will change based on the day um depending on where fifa is at on any given day um so yeah essentially a live streaming platform you have a live chat you have the game that you stream and then you have a cam so that you know your audience can connect with you via chat you can talk back and it, it was nice. I started during COVID. Um, and in Ontario, as you probably know, um, during COVID, it was like crazy. Like it was everything was locked down. There was no socializing at all. Um, so it was a nice little like distraction and outlet 
I guess, for that social aspect. Um, but yeah, streaming is a lot of fun. It can be tiring because you're, you know, on and you're in front of a camera live for several hours, but you're able to build a, a community of people all over the world that have similar interests. Obviously, people will, you know, align with your community based on the content that you produce and the person that you are and the interests that you have. So me being a Madrid fan and from Canada and, you know, I play football, I play FIFA, whatever. Um, it's kind of like-minded individuals that uh, all kind of in- consume the same content and engage in the same thing. So when you say you play FIFA Ultimate Team, so that mm-hmm. is that's different from playing FIFA, right? Like, are you Ish, you're yeah. playing the games or are you just doing the thing where you're building a team and you're... So both. Um, okay. You can... So FIFA has, for people, I guess, that haven't or aren't super familiar with FIFA, like, in general, they, there's different game modes. So you can play offline game modes um, or online game modes that aren't Ultimate Team, like Pro Clubs, for example. A lot of people play to just connect with their friends um, and have a little fun. You can play offline game modes like Kickoff and stuff um, with your friends like if you had someone over you guys could you know sit down and play a game against each other in the same room but then ultimate team allows you to kind of build your ultimate team with all of these different cards every week there's a new promo that um where ea will release different items to put in your team with different players different card designs all of that and then with that team that you kind of create you can play online um so there's different online game modes as well there's division rivals which is kind of like a you can look at it as like a a like a league game your goal is to you know make it to the elite division or division one and you just play games the more games you win the more points you earn and the more points you earn the faster you get promoted um foot champions is like a a week we call it weekend league so it's like a weekend game mode friday to sunday you have to get enough rivals points to be able to enter foot champions and you have 20 games and you basically play your 20 games and you play to ideally get the highest rank that you can get so that's like tournament football on top of like your league games every so often uh so it's fun it's um what's the word sometimes very emotional i would say <laughs> but in what a lot sense of fun. in what sense it's just it, you're playing against other people online right so you're playing against any you know different person picture in madrid language you can play against you know, like a Liverpool, high press, quick, easy, you can attack, you score lots of goals, easy. Or you could play against like a Cadiz where they just play low block the whole game and you have, you know, an extremely difficult time to even break through their defensive line and get in behind. Um, so <laughs> two very different, like everyone has a different play style. It can get really frustrating, especially um, foot champs where you have a limited amount of games to get a certain rank. and you know, your goal is obviously to win all of those games. But if you concede a stupid penalty or if you, you know, are playing against someone that has a a certain play style, it gets it gets very emotional. You get very invested into into these games, which is crazy. Sometimes you forget that it's only a video game, but <laughs> it uh, it holds a lot of value in people players lives i would imagine <laughs> well in, in this day and age it's not a vid- not just a video game anymore it's an esport no. and um it's uh it's taken much more seriously than i mean look video games were always taken seriously uh by everyone growing up cuz you get emotional you get you get you know a little, little bit of rage just kicks in when your buddy <laughs> even back in the day when it wasn't online you just have your friends over you you all grab an n64 controller and you just get pissed off because just some things aren't going your way. But yeah. <laughs> like that actually sounds really interesting to me and kind of maybe more interesting than the way I look at FIFA, which is when I have time, I'll just pick up a controller or if I want to wind down at a certain point before bed or if I have some cousins over or something. But um, as someone who has never dipped my toes into FIFA Ultimate Team, and I know we have a lot of listeners and patrons who actually are pretty serious in FIFA Ultimate Team. Um, so a lot of what you said is probably 
sounds pretty basic to them, but a lot of it is new to me. I have a business mentor and he kind of helps me with um, just the just podcast ideas and stuff. And he said, man, you, you're in the wrong business. You would make so much more money if you were doing a podcast about FIFA Ultimate Team than you were just about <laughs> Real Madrid. And I was like, look, man, I know nothing about that universe. And I'm kind of scared <laughs> to get into it because I feel like I would get really addicted to it because it just mm-hmm. seems like something that, uh, it's totally time consuming, but I love the idea that you could play with like Real Madrid legends. Um, mm-hmm. and that, that sounds cool. But if, if I were to just start from scratch, how do I get started in that? So if you open your like FIFA game for the first time, you get these basic, um, pack, like you pick a nation, you pick a team and you get some starter packs that you can open and get cards. So ultimately what you want to do is you want to be able to buy and sell those cards on the market like you would in real life. Um, you can sell cards at a profit, you can earn coins that you then can buy better cards. You also have the option of obviously buying like in-game currency that you can open the big packs to, to get the cards. Can I interject um, a lot with people... a really stupid question? Yeah. This is real money, right? Yes. Okay. So, well, yes and no. So the virtual currency is something that you can do just by buying and selling cards. If you buy FIFA points, um, that's using like real money, like real currency where you'll pay, depending on how many points you want to buy, you'll pay in Canadian dollars. It's like $135 for 12,000, which is insane, but we do it anyway. And, um, but a lot of people, what's interesting is you can kind of manage your club any way that you want. Um, obviously being a creator, I do buy people points, but a lot of people will just run an RTG, like a road to glory and not spend a dime. So they'll buy cards, they'll sell them at a profit. There's a lot of creators now that create that kind of content um, in terms of like transfer market value, when to sell, when to buy or whatever. Um, That is not my forte. I always, um, unfortunately, will buy and then sell when they're at like an all time low. So (laughs) I'm not the person to get trading advice from for sure. But um, yeah, you start from scratch with your, you know, your gold cards. And then eventually, um, once you earn enough virtual currency, you can sell them and and purchase new ones. The more games you play as well in division rivals or squad battles or whatever, um, the more coins you can earn. So it is possible without spending money, which is kind of fun. And then the great thing about Ultimate Team or just FIFA in general, um, especially, you know, for even myself, I think everyone, you you get to know and understand players that you wouldn't typically. So whether that's, you know, a new promo card that comes out for a player that plays in a in a league that you wouldn't typically watch, or sometimes they do like right now we have like they call them showdown cards. So if there's like a matchup in the Classico, for example, um, they did this. I don't know if they'll do it for Wednesday, but they did this previously this year. Well, they'll have, I think it was Tobias and I forget who the Barcelona player was, but whichever team wins, then that respective card will upgrade. So it almost like entices players or FIFA players to watch real life football as well, which then will connect you more with like the real sport or the real players, which is really cool. I feel like, you know, every FIFA player listening or, or, or not can probably attest to knowing like all of the flags. If they were ever quizzed on their flag knowledge, they would be able to like easily answer those questions or even players like what club do they play for? What position are they? Um, A lot of what are they right footed or left footed? Like, Can they scale or can they not? A lot of that you learn from FIFA, which is, I feel, you know, an underrated um, aspect of the game Um, because, yeah, it just connects you with the real life players in the real life game. I did see when I was scrolling, I saw that you got a Desai card. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Very, very awesome. Just incredible defender. Um, Part of France's Mm -hmm. 98 World Cup title. Uh, so, but so what you do on Twitch, that's separate from the comms, right? Yes. So can, yeah. can you so, talk I mean, about that, the comms? Yeah. So it obviously started with Twitch. That's kind of how this whole journey started. I I think I've always been, I have always just liked to be, whether it's, you know, in person or in front of camera, whatever the case is, I feel like I'm just, I have that kind of energy. I like to entertain I would say 
Um, and so, yeah, it started with Twitch and then things kind of just evolved from there. Um, my first casting opportunity that I had was a virtual one. Um, it was for the E Libertadores, uh, 2021, I believe. Yeah. 2021. Um, and yeah, it was virtual. It was the finals were in Paraguay, um, which was really cool different very 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 different um being all online like I was in my bedroom um actually that was it was during one of the show days I think was the day that we lost for nothing to, to Barcelona <laughs> um so yeah <laughs> yep a very ingrained in my memory unfortunately um but that's all they have on us anyway so it's fine um but yeah it was fun exciting but not the full experience at all I think that you know it was it was almost good that that was the opportunity to kind of dip my toes in the water and and see if I enjoyed it or would like it and I feel like I have I know the sport I know the esport and I have the energy to be able to like talk about these things on camera I'm not you know shy in front of people in front of camera so yeah, it was kind of like a, a trial run to see. And afterwards, um, one of the producers from the uh, Global Series, which is what I work with now, reached out to me and wanted to see if I was interested in doing a LAN event, um, which is, for those that don't know, is like a real life um, in-person event. And I said, yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. I would love to. Um and this was my first like opportunity to even travel with work. I had gone to Austin actually for the EMLS cup, but it was a little bit different. Um, I had done like a live stream watch party from there. So that's obviously my comfort zone. That's what I'm used to. It's easy to watch something and just talk about it. Um, but, you know, being at the desk um, or in the commentary booth in person with people watching you under that pressure, you know, there's lights on you, there's cameras on you, you go in for makeup, like that's a whole different experience. So yeah, that was my first um, opportunity to travel for work, which was amazing. And um, it was for team of the season cup in last year, 2022. And yeah, a whole, a whole different ball game. Um, like I said, being in front of camera, being like, under that different kind of pressure um, is fun. It's it's really exciting. It's really exhilarating. And I think that, you know, being able to talk about the sport and also the game um, and then also about the players, like they're real life players almost. Um, it's a it's a really, really, really interesting um, industry that I think, goes, like you said, goes under the radar, but has become so big, not just FIFA, just esports in general. And that whole, like, there's a lot of prize money that can be won in, in esports, period. Um, and FIFA as well. And I think the players, like, thrive for events like this. They really, really enjoy, like, going and playing at, on that big stage. And, yeah, it's really, it's really amazing. So now I think I've done several more <laughs> events um last year and this year and have a few more i'm doing um i just finished doing eprem and i'm doing e champions league as well um which is really cool i'll be in london in a couple weeks and then we'll be in istanbul actually for the e champions league final the same weekend as, or the same week rather as the actual champions league final so um yeah it's really it's it's crazy actually i don't think people would realize what actually goes into events like these, like the production and the, the, you know, even the, the people that are required to run an event, like it's not just, you think of esports tournaments or LAN events and you just think of like, you know, 10 to 30 people just like playing video games at a console around the table kind of situation. But these things are like, there's lighting, there's cinematography, there's production, there's entire crews, there's hair, makeup, like, then you have the players that have their own like lounge and uh, it, it, it's amazing. It's, it's really, really amazing. And I think, yeah, it's a, uh, I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. It's unbelievable. Like I really still haven't really truly grasped it to be honest with you, partly because I'm so out of that universe, but it's such a massive universe, you know? And it's crazy because it's, you're just talking about one game. 
Yeah, yeah. There's like for almost every game, there's a world like this. And with stadiums that are sold out, I I don't know if they're actually stadiums, but rooms like auditoriums, whatever they're called, that are sold out. People are just watching these players play video games. There's commentary, there's, um, you know, everything that like what PK is doing. Yeah. Um, No, it's like FIFA is one of the smaller esports, I would say. mm. Like you have Call of Duty, you have Halo, CSGO, Valorant, like all of these have even Apex, Rocket League. They have like, huge events with hundreds of thousands sometimes millions of dollars on the line um and it's yeah it's crazy crazy these kids i mean some of these kids are making more money than our you know parents and grandparents who would never even dream of in over an entire lifetime like the the amount of different things you can do to make money now um it's crazy. crazy this this is this is truly crazy um i have a i guess a technical question about fifa Okay. I am of the firm belief, although I'm not that good enough to really make a claim either way. <laughs> how, how, okay, this is the question. How much of FIFA is luck and how much of it is skill? Like how much of it is just random? Like you, you just get, you need the ball to go bounce your way. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And how much of it is like, yeah, like these guys, there's like a true... Like, I understand, like, if, if you put me against one of these guys that you commentate, I'd probably lose 30 nothing. So, obviously, there is a <laughs> skill level that is involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at times, it's just, like, I feel like I had I had one that I posted a few months ago on Twitter, a screenshot. My XG was 9.9. And <laughs> my opponent's XG was point something. Like, it was less than mm-hmm. 0.5. And he beat me one mm-hmm. nothing, And I couldn't comprehend. There's also a conspiracy theory that I've read that PSG is unstoppable because the Qataris have paid FIFA that every time Mbappe or Messi or Neymar or anyone has the ball, they just, it's just like glue. You can't take it out. The, ba- the ball will bounce their way. Their goalkeeper Donnarumma is unstoppable. All, <laughs> can you talk to me about this side of FIFA? How much of that is luck and how much of this is just, just, just BS like bounces here and there? It's, so funny you say that and like not having it's so funny you say that like you're not super in tune with the the ultimate team in the FIFA world but then (laughs) but then say that because you're like speaking everyone's language I feel um but no I think that there is some like randomness to it like if you have a, a a ball bounce away or like rebound or deflect in a certain way but the way that these players play I can't even I can't and I I say this live like on on commentary for these some of these events i don't understand how they do it and it's crazy i mean like there's and basically what happens is these pros every year there's some mechanic changes and it's really about finding what the meta is for that any given year so there's like low driven shots one year was finesse shots one year was crosses and headers um this year was travellas so knowing that but knowing also how to like understand the mechanics of the game and then almost how to manipulate that um is what these guys do best guys do best and i think that with cards that you use like i think i would say i would i'm probably an above average fifa player give or take nowhere near them at all but i utilize my team and the mechanics and the players that i have on my team probably like to maybe 40 to 60 percent than what they're actually capable of because every card similar to real life has attributes so they have like traits that they're best at so like Modric for example would have a Travella shot um like Tony Cruz would have free kicks or what have you like they would have the traits that they're best at but then also they would have like um their in-game stats that are so you know they would have like their heading accuracy their free kick accuracy shot power this that whatever and all of those play a factor with how the card performs in game so like with Mbappe or Neymar for example like obviously Neymar's close control dribbling and Mbappe's close control dribbling is going to be a lot better than like a card that I play with even like if you play with uh like Mbappe 
versus Benzema in game, they're going to feel completely different because they're two different body types, which they have like on the card, different body types. They're two different. They have two different play styles. Um, they've introduced something this year um, and it's determines the way it's like, it's hard to explain <laughs> without confusing too many people. But no, like, I, I, I'm, I'm getting players. it. So every player has their strength. And I think like the truly elite players just know how to maximize each player. Whereas like some doofus like me is playing, like <laughs> using everybody the same way. You know what I mean? Exactly. And I think that, well, no, not exactly. <laughs> I'm not exactly. saying anything. Doofus. Yeah, got it. <laughs> But like even like that that's what differenti- these, differentiates these players from just like average, you know, like casual players um, is that they're us- utilizing these cards to their strengths. And on top of that, they know how to do every skill move in the game. They know how to like, you know what I mean? Like the way that they can create space versus the way that like you and I would create space um, in the game is completely different. And I think that, yeah, that's what separates that. Um and then in terms of the way that, like, things, like you can get unlucky at times. You can get, like, dumb, concede dumb goals that are just, like, deflections that your goalkeeper probably should have saved or, you know, whatever the case is. A penalty that, you know, maybe I would argue with, with, is not a penalty. But, um, yeah, there there is, to answer your question in a roundabout way, I feel like there is a lot of skill um, to be, like, elite, elite. And I think that's why so many players just aren't at that level because a people don't want to put that kind of time in. Like these these pro players play like at least like a full time job, at least forty yeah. hours a week, if not yeah. more. Um, so you know, most of us at any given time have you know nine to fives where we're working. We get home. Do we really want to put in another six hours to try and learn all of these mechanics? No. Yeah. Um, but that's their job and that's what they do. And I think, yeah, I mean, the discipline pays off because then they go on and win hundreds of thousands of dollars for competing in a video game, which is crazy. Amazing. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's absolutely wild. Um, yeah. So I, the FIFA thing, I, I had some of those technical questions cause I was really interested because the, the meta is obviously something that's totally different than the actual real life sport. Right. And so if you're, yeah. If you're just watching the game and you're used to like playing the game in the real life world, that's mm-hmm. for me anyway, your brain is wired to play like real life. But then there's the meta, yeah. which I don't even know how to begin to figure out unless I'm doing it full time. The one that irked me about to be now, mind you, I haven't even gotten 23. So I'm that's how behind I am. I'm, I'm 22. So <laughs> I don't know if this is still the case. But the one that irked me about 22 was that right from the kickoff, the opponent tries to score right away without making a pass. Mm-hmm. You're like, <laughs> so like, so like that one irked me. Like this is, they got to do something about that. I don't know. Did they fix that in 23 <laughs> or not? I think it depends again. I, I, again, I think it's one of those mechanic things that people will try to manipulate. Um, I feel like that's been one of those things that people don't know if it's, thing or not um similar to like if you have like in in tournaments for example if you have the ball at the 45th minute or the 90th minute um the consensus is it's a little it feels like it's a little easier to score like Mm. if you get you know a chance in front of goal and you shoot it in the 45th minute or the 90th minute like there's a good chance that that will go in and so what you'll see in tournaments is these pro players will hold on to possession in their end to not give their opponent possession to be able to score or have a chance on goal in that 90th and 45th minute. So yeah, it's one of those things that, I mean, like I'm a terrible defender in games. So if someone's going to concede a kickoff, it's going to be me. Um, I think that there's probably like, I, that's the thing is that I see this in casual play, but I don't really see that as much in the, in the professional world so then you start to wonder well maybe maybe it's just me (laughs) maybe i'm just maybe it's just a skill gap and i'm just a bad defender and if they're not conceding it then you know maybe (laughs) maybe it's just me but yeah i think that you know fifa has had so many I feel like there are so many different conspiracy theories out there about the game and and what is actually true and what's not 
I don't know. Will we ever know? Probably yeah. not. Uh, this is actually this is super fascinating to me. I I I could we could go on two more hours just me asking you questions about FIFA, um, <laughs> and just kind of the technical aspect of it and what works and what doesn't, and uh, but but it it is super interesting to me. Um, I think they should add one meta where it's like if you're Real Madrid and you're down by two goals in the second half. <laughs> it should just be like you just get all the momentum and everything you do works. <laughs> like eighty fifth minute and on, you get you you can score like three goals if you're under. That would be a a realistic meta to add. Um, it would be realistic, wouldn't it? <laughs> what's what's the future of FIFA esports in ten years? What does it look like? It's hard to say. I feel like, especially with COVID, I feel like everything has transitioned. Like the world has just adapted to be virtual yeah um and so i think that fifa esports has been around for a long time and and esports period has been around for a long time but i think people are just like beginning to understand what that virtual world is like um especially like between generations like you know you explain to even like our, our parents what i do you know what i mean for a living like streaming on the internet to people like yeah. They'll, they'll say, hey, why are people watching you play video games? That makes no sense, you know? So I think it's that crazy. there's... It'll be normal. It's, it's it'll be normalized. I mean, now it's normalized. In 10 years, it'll be... Like, like your kids will will just get it, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, I... It's even weird. I feel like we... I grew up on the cusp, you know? So for, like, half my life, I didn't... Like, I grew up without internet, electronics. I didn't have a cell... I don't have an iPad. I don't have a cell phone, you know? Um, so it's interesting even to me to see how far things evol- have evolved in my lifetime. Um, but then you look at like what has happened in the last five, even 10 years. Uh, so I, I can only imagine what it'll be, but I think, yeah, I think that there's just so many opportunities in the esports world. Um, not just with FIFA. Um, and even in terms of like, content in general like the internet and the the virtual side of things has just opened up so many more opportunities for so many different things you know so i hope i hope it continues to grow and it continues to to be bigger i think that you know we're seeing a big shift right now especially um with like even a lot of clubs a lot of uh, leagues are doing their own like virtual league their virtual you know like Ila Liga for example just had a tournament this weekend where not all of the clubs Real Madrid doesn't have a an esports team yet but hopefully soon um but you know like clubs will have their own respective esports players that will represent the club at these tournaments um same with Eprem last weekend for example so who gets to play with the team like who gets to represent the club how does that work there's usually tryouts um, or okay. like clubs will will approach you directly. Like if you have, mm. you know, any kind of, um, I guess, stature, for lack of a better word, within the FIFA community. Like if you are a known pro player, a lot of these players play for club and like their own respective esports team. So that's crazy. There's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole world. Like it's nuts for people on the outside like there's so much to know and understand it's like almost playing for club and country well they do play for their country as well they have they introduced that um pretty recently as well where they play like the fifa e world cup where so these players will represent their esports team that they are assigned to and then they'll represent a club and then on top of that they'll represent their country at the world cup um so yeah it's 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 nuts so i think the more the moral of the story is the more clubs that come on board and the more leagues that do this, um, which is what we've seen, like there's Australian leagues, there's Liga, there's Serie A, like all of these players play for the respective teams that they support or, you know, places that they're from. And then they're assigned to esports teams all over the world. Like there's um, a couple players from England that are assigned to like MLS teams that play in the EMLS. There's a few players in the EMLS that play in Europe. Um, with esports teams so it's yeah it's worldwide it's global and and fifa to to think that fifa is not even the biggest esport but to see it at this level it's very it puts things into perspective especially i 
would have never realized in a million years that it was like this. I'm like, as as much as I think it's amazing and I think it's incredible to have these opportunities now that we didn't have when we were kids, I got to be honest, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about it. Just because, mm-hmm. like, I'll give you an example on a micro scale. My five-year-old son, who is in primary, came to me the other day and said, hey, um, all my friends at school play Mario and Minecraft. Can you get me that? And I was like, <laughs> you're in primary. What are you talking about? <laughs> you should be asking me, can we go swimming? Can we go for a hike in nature? That's what I want for you. Um, yeah. I, it's not that I, I I don't think people should be doing it. It's awesome that people are doing it. But I kind of worried like in 20, 20 years, are we all just going to be sitting down our whole lives uh, on screens? Yeah. And, uh, and that's kind of where I'm scared a little bit. But uh, yeah. It's crazy. I feel like... Yeah, that's the only thing with the, I think, I think there's a a good balance, but it's like the pressure, like the societal pressure on like, you know what I mean? Like, like you said, like all, all of your son's kids, all of your son's friends have X, Y, Z. I hope my son doesn't have kids yet. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) That would be weird. No. Um, But uh, yeah, like all of your son's friends have, you know, whatever. And it's that like societal pressure of like, you want to be, you know, you want to, you want him to fit in, but then you want him also to, you know what I mean? I feel like it's the same yeah. at any age. It's like, especially with social media and all of that, it's like, you want to do things that people are doing while also still maintaining some level of like, I guess, authenticity for lack of a better word. Um, and I think that's why we were so lucky to grow up in the, the era that we did like we're you know alive and young to be able to experience this part but also like we had a very fulfill it like I was out in the backyard playing in mud (laughs) like making you know whatever with my imagination I wasn't I didn't I think I had a cell phone when I was 16 whereas like eight-year-olds now have cell phones yeah wait how how old are you 30 yeah yeah so you got all the cool stuff of the 90s um yeah yeah. Yeah. Um, it's exactly. uh, we yeah, we were I think, like you said earlier, we were kind of on the on the cusp of of a generation like before the complete virtual revolution. And now we it's be yeah. interesting to see how our, our, our kids juggle it. Um, yeah, I mm-hmm. people people still find it crazy that, you know, I watch Real Madrid for my work. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, you can't like yeah. I, often people will ask me if I hang out and they they don't understand, like, I'm watching soccer and they're like, so you can hang out and like, no, I'm actually working. But like, and then you have yeah. what you're doing. And I can't imagine what my son's response will be if something that I can't even think about right now um, in 20, 30 years. It, it'll be super interesting. Uh, we got to go. This was really fun. This flew by. Yeah, uh, I hope you can come on yeah, more often. Do you want to give us your quick prediction for Wednesday's Classico? Listen, if we played like we played yesterday and score a goal fest like we did yesterday, I think I, the, the thing for me is the league done? So right now our focus is on Champions League. Every, everything else is done. You know what I mean? Like everything else is gone. So it's Copa del Rey and Champions League. I think that we won and we won by a lot. We'll be confident going into Wednesday. Um, we have nothing else to lose at this point. Um, and injuries are a little concerning. Lineup predictions are a little concerning. I don't know what Ancelotti's going to do. But yeah, if we... Uh, Line up like we did yesterday. Um, dare I say, even with Asensio, um, or maybe Asensio for Fede, I think we'll demolish. Hopefully, not on wood, but yeah. I would yeah. love to win. Go ahead, sorry. No, just said that with regards to the lineup, the one name that I really want to start again, like the Valladolid game, is Rodrigo. Um, yeah. I, I think it would be hard for Ancelotti to bench Fede. Fede can just come in with the Asen- in the Asensio role. Modric is also mm-hmm. hard to bench in a game like this. But yeah. Rodrigo was the one, if he's on the field, we saw it yesterday. So much, There's so much help that Vinicius and Benzema get from that, to have that third that's attacking a- presence. Yes, I think that's exactly, I know we're almost out of time, but I, that's the thing for me, is that all of our attacks are going down the left. You know what I mean? And obviously with whatever left back we put there, Kamaving is great at left back, but I think he's better suited, obviously, as a as a midfielder. Um, but 
having Rodrigo be able to even like fluidly interchange like he did with Asensio yesterday, I feel like gives us so many more options and Rodrigo is amazing. But the thing about Rodrigo is he doesn't have, like, I think that he could be, he is incredible, but I think he could be like one of the best wingers in Europe, a hundred percent, like top five, dare I say even top three, if he had consistency in game time and consistency in position but the poor guy like starts a game plays 10 minutes plays 30 plays 90 and then sometimes he plays like centrally or he plays on the right sometimes he plays on the left you know what I mean so like he needs to have a solidified position to be able to like fully develop um to his potential but we see it in every game we see what he can do especially on the left but yeah Anyway, all of that to say, I think that um, he needs to start almost every game. And I think Fede's great on the right. Um, Fede supports Carvajal, which God knows they need. Um, but I think that, again, he's better suited centrally because I feel like he has, he's got the offensive ability, but also the defensive ability. But sometimes there's just not entirely the production that we need on the right you know but Rodrigo like will take on a man Rodrigo has the the you know dribbling to be able to create space much more than than Fede does I think on the right so anyways that's my two cents yeah no I I completely agree I think Fede is better suited in a midfield role and Lucas and I had a segment on the podcast the other day where someone asked us is is Vinicius like that much better than Rodrigo and my answer was like, I think there was some bad fortune with Rodrigo in the timeline that he came up because when he, mm-hmm. he came up a little bit after Vinicius and mm-hmm. Vinicius had already cemented the left wing, rightfully so, uh, nothing to take away from Vinicius. But I think if it had been kind of flipped and Rodrigo came up first, I think he very possibly would have been a, uh, just a fixed starter. And I think yeah. he was just a little bit unlucky in that scenario because he's amazing. And and he's definitely yeah. too good to be coming off the bench. Too good. Um, yeah, hopefully I that'll totally agree. Yeah. Agreed. All right, Leah. I agree. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for your Likewise. time. We'll chat soon. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. And before we send you along on your way, we wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. Thank you so much for the support. We love that you're a part of this Real Madrid family, which continues to grow. And specific shout out to our $10 plus patrons, because if you pledge $10 or more, not only do you get guaranteed responses to your questions and get access to all the podcasts, you also get a specific shout out on the podcast. So shout out to Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Wei Pering, Wamik Jamal, Tobias Royal Botcher, Talib Salhab, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Damala, Sujai Wani, Somanchu Singh, Sheikh Hatiri, Shabaz Sharapov, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorzano, Samuli Justin, Samer Z, Said Mahad, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Saad Omar, Rodrigo Balmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Patrick Odiafati, Oscar Barrera, Nico Laxo, Nicholas Moller, Nick Ribeiro, Nelson Mazariego, Naveen Babu, Ramesh Babu, Mowgli, MJ Diego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lext, Logan Stahl, Leon Stavernakis, Kunal Tilakar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, Jason Fitz, Ian Marley, Graham Gerard. Gary Kohut, Frederick Rantakiro, Frederick Sundros, S.A. Davisito, Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Connor McMorrow, Christian Toft, Krishna Costa, Charles Williams, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Ashik Bashar, Arnab Mukherjee, Armand Gashi, Armando L., Anthony, Tharp, Anthony Tharp, Anirudh Singh, Andres Silvestre, Ananya Kumar, Alex Rose, Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adar Zalukovic, Adam Dorsey, Bella Chow, Ramtin Magrur, Manaf Al Haddad, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. You guys are absolute legends. Thank you guys so much for the support. We will see you next time in Halamarid.